um, I just tell you to be ready because I never know. I don't pre-think it. I just hear the Holy Spirit when he tells me to make contact with the individual that's supposed to speak. I do that. And this is no exception. It just so happened that it was extremely short notice uh, for the individual. And I'm always pleased with people who say, let's do it. <laughs> Even if they don't know what Holy Spirit is going to do with it, amen, whatever it is. And tonight is no exception. His name, he's new to us uh, by a few years. He's been with us now for a couple of years. And uh, he was ordained on last Sunday into the ministry, a full-time ministry with the Lord as the Lord's beginning to work in his life and his lovely wife's life. Would you welcome none other than Reverend Mike Kaler. Pray with me first. Father, I feel honored to speak into this group, to speak into their lives. But you know, and I know, it's not by my strength, but by the power of you in me. I ask now that the Holy Spirit will put thoughts in my mind and words in my mouth and let me say what the people need to hear. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you. I'll just start out sharing a little bit of my heart with you. Uh, I mean it by it's not in my strength. I'm not up here. Um, when I was in high school, I, I loved all kinds of math. I took everything that our high school offered and I'd done well in all of them, so I decided to enter the um, College of Engineering here at the U. And I'd done fine in all my engineering classes, but they had one called rhetoric that they thought we ought to take to be a well-rounded student. And I hated that class. <laughs> you had to get up in front of a group and speak. Um, after class one day, the professor was walking with me, and he said, you'd really like to farm, wouldn't you? <laughs> I said, man, if it's that obvious, I'm out of here. I finished the semester, but I never went back. And I think of when we are born again, Scripture says we become a new creature, a new person. All has become new. When you know our worldly thoughts, Sometimes we question that. I think I still struggle with the same temptations. I still deal with shortcomings. But I can tell you one thing. The old man would not be standing up here in front of you. So I thank God for those changes. Last Sunday was a special time for me. <laughs> I think being ordained at 75 years old, most pastors are retiring by that time. <laughs> and, and I question myself as why did it take so long? I felt a calling all my life. Even before we were married, I felt a call. I didn't know call to what. The churches I were in didn't necessarily encourage that or, or guide you. I just knew that God has something special. But there's a lot that prevented that from happening along the way. One, I was way too ambitious, too work-driven. God gave me a lot of talents, and there wasn't too much I couldn't do. And I didn't have to re rely on him. He finally got through to me. <laughs> Back when I was like 45 years old, he came to me in a dream one night. And he said, you know, I sent Adam out of the garden to tell the soil as a punishment. 
why do you want to punish yourself? So, even though I love foreman, man, I loved working day and night, and I did. A lot of nights I didn't go to bed at all. But God knew the path that that would lead to. And I was convinced when I got the dream. It took me two years to convince Mary Lou that <laughs> we were supposed to be doing something different. But even that, and then we moved to Corville for, we were up here 18 years. But even in that, I didn't see what God wanted for me. When I came up here and worked a 40 hour work week, I thought I was on vacation. Didn't know what to do with all my time. So we started looking for other things to do. We cleaned a church at uh, Solon for five years. We cleaned one at West or North Liberty for five years. I bought a carpet cleaning machine and I'd done that work at night. We cleaned a bank. I shingled homes. So I still was a workaholic. But the main thing that I want to speak to you tonight that kept me from becoming what God wanted me to be was offenses. And I think even though I'm talking to a relatively small group tonight, I'm surely talking to somebody that needs to hear this word. And if you don't, I need to hear it again. Mm. I was honored to be ordained. But you know, God doesn't set us aside for honor. He sets us aside to serve. And I pray that you, being a part of our congregation, will take advantage of that. The only way I know how to serve right now, other than what I'm already doing, is just exhorting you, teaching you to maybe not fall in the same traps I did. Um, I want you not to take 70 some years to get to the position I'm in. I've learned a lot over those years, a lot lately. And there's several things I was going to share tonight, but the first was the offense, and God said, stick with that. He says, if my people don't understand that, nothing else you say would do them any good. I've got notes I'm going to read a lot from. I don't like people that speak in, from notes. <laughs> but I think that a lot of this is so important, I don't want to mess up my first time being in front of you. Uh, it says, many are unable to function properly in their calling because of the wounds and hurts that offenses have caused in their lives. And you know what Luke 17, 1 says, it doesn't say how to deal with offenses if they come, it says they will come. <laughs> and even though I, I finally dealt with my past offenses, <laughs> I know there'll be more to come to, to raise their ugly head. But if we have the knowledge and know what God wants to bring about from our offenses, we don't have to we don't have to take them on they will come but they should shed off our back like water off a duck you know but that's a hard lesson to learn <laughs> oh yeah it is and i hope that anything that comes from this pulpit is backed up by the word but you know the word e either can confirm something that we already know or it will convict us of something. Mm -hmm. yes. And a lot of times those convictions can bring offense. Yes. Yes. And a lot of times, you know, I always wondered why, why was I being offended? 
mostly by church leaders. But offenses doesn't come from somebody that isn't close to us. It's always a family member, a close friend, or church leadership. And the devil's got a purpose in that, especially in the church. He doesn't want to see God's work progress. <laughs> I, I, and if any of you are struggling with this, this book by John Bevere, The Bait of Satan, is excellent. Excellent. He talks about, you know, Satan sets a trap. And he baits it well. And once you are offended and take on that offense, he says, I got gotcha. you. It's hard to get out of that. If any of you know anything about trapping animals, the only way out of a trap is they'll usually chew their foot off chew their leg off so they can go free. That's a tough, <laughs> tough situation. But that's almost what we face when we take on an offense. It's hard, hard to get rid of it. And even now, even though I know all this and have overcome a lot of it, I still would like to share some things with you about how bad I was offended. But... <laughs> We have to really, really fight that temptation. That's like pouring gas on the fire. You know, it's our responsibility to put the fire out. Not, you know, worldly, we want to tell others and get their um, sympathy and, and get them on our side. Man, you might say, Mike, you don't know what I've been through. It isn't that I don't care, it's that it doesn't matter. It does not matter what you've been through. You know, even though Satan brings this upon us, God allows it because it's one of his fiery furnaces that matures us, refines us. Mm. resist the devil by not being offended there's only one person can get you out of the will of God and that is you this book is so <laughs> right on that I want to read just a little bit, a couple different places, if I can see through the tears. He says in this one paragraph, how many leaders have cut off men under them because of suspicion? Why are those leaders suspicious? Because they are not serving God. They are serving a vision like Saul. They are insecure in their calling, and that breeds jealousy and pride. They recognize qualities in people that they know are godly, and they are willing to use those people as long as it benefits them. And I've seen that over and over. Now, I don't believe we have that situation here. I thank God for this church. And, and <laughs> The only reason we're here is we got so disappointed with other churches. I would be perfectly satisfied if we live in the country, got a reasonably nice home. I'd be perfectly satisfied to sit out there on the deck and worship God. Forget about church. But God said, no. He said, you don't know what kind of a Christian you are if you sit out there by yourself until you deal with people. You don't know where your faith is. Right. 
so I even thought about starting my church. <laughs> I could see a vision, see what God wanted. But again, he said, no. He said, you need to be under another authority. One that knows more than you know. One that walks with me. You sit and learn. So we come here with no agenda. I don't think I even hinted about being in leadership. Pastor Tommy just come to me a few weeks ago and asked if I'd be willing to be ordained. I said, man, I waited for that all my life, but I did. I, I had kind of given up on that vision. And even after last Sunday's ordination, <laughs> people were congratulating us, and Janice came up to me and she says, I don't know whether to congratulate you or not. Well, I knew exactly what she meant by that. <laughs> it, it's a responsibility. Yes. It's a lot of work. Yes. It's submitting. Yes. You're not your own. But I praise God for it all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Humility and refusing to avenge yourself are the keys that will keep you from the prison of offense. Do not sow discord or separation. You know, this morning Tommy was uh, had had the illustration of the train. If you take on an offense, you're not out pushing the train. You totally derailed. It keeps you from doing what God has called you to do. It sidetracks you, man. It it. <laughs> think about running a race. You're just out sitting on the bench, you know. And it takes a while. And and, and so many people will get offended and leave. Whatever you take from one offense, you're going to carry into the next relationship or church you go to. You've got to deal with it. And you know, we're in good company. Jesus offended many <laughs> while he ministered, but he loved them enough to speak the truth. You know, we don't just tippy-toe around. We're going we're to speak the word. If it's offending, that's your problem. Mm. Jesus offended some people by obeying his father, but he never caused an offense in order to assert his own rights. Now, if you desire the approval of men, God's anointing cannot fall upon you. Mm. You must purpose in your heart to speak the word of God and perform his will, even at the risk of offending others. And if I ever offend you, I pray that you either come to me or Tommy and express that. You know, it's, it's don't let it go any farther, because sometimes you can't always fight that on your own. And like I said earlier, God allows these things to happen for your benefit, to, to mature. We run from the very thing that will bring strength to our lives. Those who are hurt and disappointed are those who have come to Jesus for what he can do for them, not because of who he is. I had another reference marked down to read out of the book. Jesus desires to heal our wounds, but we often do not let him heal them because it is not the easiest road to take. It is a path of humility and self-denial. 
that leads to healing and spiritual maturity. It is a decision to make another's will, well-being more important than your own, even when that person has brought you great sorrow. Pride cannot travel this path, but only those who desire peace at the risk of rejection. It is a trial which leads to humiliation and abasement. It is the road that leads to life. So, what do we need to do if we get offended, if we pick up an offense? You know, it, it, it's hard not to pick up some of those offenses because they're so personal. You know, they cut to the core. People can hurt by their words, whether, whether it's actually what they meant or not. But Satan will cause you to hear it in a word that will tend to destroy you. But what, what are some of the things we need to do? What God reveals by his spirit cannot be taken from us. This must be the foundation of all we do. Without it, we will be easily offended by trials and tribulations that blindside us. You're not going to see them coming. They have no warning. They catch us off guard, and that's why sometimes it, it's, it's hard to deal with. We just aren't looking for them. You know, ground will produce only what is planted in it. If we plant seeds of unforgiveness and offense, another root will spring up in place of the love of God, and it is called the root of bitterness. If roots are not dealt with quickly, they increase in strength. And heaven help a bitter person. Do not be afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal any unforgiveness or bitterness. You know, we can have hidden unforgiveness. And, and it's not easy. Even, even the ones that I've been through, I think, you know, I've forgiven. But, but that, it doesn't go away. You know, if you let yourself, they, they'll keep coming back. But you have to keep after them. The longer you hide it, the stronger it will become, and the harder your heart will grow. Stay tender-hearted. How, you ask, do you do that? Well, let's look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, outbursts, and blasphemies with all malice be taken away from you and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Hmm. You know, even if you were wounded deeply, even though you have forgiven, you are still vulnerable to hurt. That's just what I was talking about. It can rise, raise itself up again and again. But recovery is our choice. Yes. Maturity does not come easily. Amen. You know, I could have said no to ordination. <laughs> just sat out there and worshiped like we always do. <laughs> But that's not maturing. That's not what God's after. And I think of all the so-called wasted years that I could have been ministering. He's not so concerned about that either. He's concerned about us getting right with him. Since we are to imitate God, we are to extend reconciliation to a brother who sins against us. If we keep the love of God as our motivation, we will not fail. Love never fails. You know, a few years ago, well, it'll be 10 years next June, 
I had a, a fairly severe heart attack. I was working on the farm, it was a hot, hot day, 105 degrees, and I was digging post holes by hand, and all of a sudden I started feeling just weird. And I thought, well, I better take a rest. I owed a bill in a nearby town, so I jumped in the pickup, grabbed me a Pepsi, and I was going to go take that bill and just rest a while. And well, on the way, I got feeling worse and worse, and I thought I probably should not be driving. But nowadays, if you pull over, nobody's going to stop and see what's wrong. So I drove on into Riverside and stopped at the implement dealer. And like I say, it was 105 out, and I was cold. I had the <laughs> windows down, and I was freezing. And I thought, this isn't right. And I went in, and they were relatively busy there. I sat on a lawnmower for a while, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And I went up to the counter and asked one of the gals if she had an aspirin. She <laughs> took one look at me. She said, no, but I'll call 911. <laughs> I said, well, if I look that bad, maybe you should, you know. <laughs> well, the first responders were there immediately, and they said, oh, you're having a heart attack. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know what a heart attack felt like. So they rushed me up here to the university, and I always say, we, Mary Lou and I both worked at the university hospital, and I said, I'd if I was brought in unexpectedly that way, I'd always know how bad off I was by what room they put me in. Well, I woke up in the CVICU. <laughs> I said, this isn't good. <laughs> but making a long story short, it, uh, I was in, inten well, I had a complete blockage on the left side. Normal procedure, you go in, open that up, put a stand in and go home. They couldn't get mine open. They worked on me two to three hours and could not get a drop of blood through it. But they never, ever cut me open. <laughs> Praise God. I spent a week in intensive care. A week. My sister, my sister, who's a good Christian, said, why didn't they operate? I says, I don't know. She says, I think you ought to get a second opinion. I said, I'm not going to beg them to cut me open. <laughs> you know? If this is God's will, let it be. She took my x-rays down to Burlington and had her doctor at the hospital look at me. So I don't know why they didn't operate. But I was on a pacemaker. They tried turning that down after about three days, and I got that weird feeling back. And I said, crank that back up. <laughs> at the end of that week, <laughs> with some prayer, I went home, no operation, no pacemaker, no nothing. A little bit of medication. And they said that, you know, plenty of exercise. They had uh, therapy for me. I went to therapy there for what? How long? 18 weeks. And I worked my tail off on those machines. I thought, if I'm going to have another heart attack, it's going to be right here in the hospital. <laughs> but God was already preparing. He was already putting a new vessel through. But my whole point of that story is that he not only gave me a new physical heart, <laughs> he gave me a new spiritual heart. A heart of love. You know, this old, <laughs> I call him an old heart farmer. <laughs> I never shed tears. The only time I ever shed tears is when my first girlfriend dumped me and when I, <laughs> and when my father passed away. Other than that, you didn't see tears. But, 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 <laughs> but since God gave me the new heart, they come very easily. Just knowing what he has done. One more scripture, and I'll end fairly soon. First Peter 4, 12, and 13. 
Beloved, do not be surprised that the fiery ordeal is taking place among you to test you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, so that you may rejoice and be glad in the revelation of his glory. Mm. Powerful words that... And notice here that he's comparing the extent of our suffering to the extent of rejoicing. How can you rejoice that to that? When his glory is revealed, you will be glorified with him. This glory is to the degree that you allow him to perfect his character within you. Look at the coming glory. So I would just encourage you to, if you've got any offense, get rid of it. Amen. Grow in it. And be aware that more offenses will come. But if you allow it, it will perfect Christ's character in you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. That's all I have for tonight. I, I just encourage you and bless you and... And I speak especially to the leadership, those of us that have been ordained. We have to watch how we walk with another. Oh, yeah. It's easily to get offended at another brother. I promise you, I will not pick up another offense as long as I live. I know I'll be tempted. And even our pastors are not immune from being attacked. So, bless you. Thank you. Praise God. I think he was going to give you a high five there. Good, you know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, you know, he's right. He is, he is very right. And I'm glad that you know, see, obviously the Holy Spirit was talking to him. He had different things, different items in his heart to talk about, but the prominent one is the one that came to the top. Yeah. And none of us are immune from offense or, um, you know, I, I, as a pastor, uh, there's a couple things that I've noticed that I didn't know before I started pastoring. Um, how, how many years have we been doing this? Eight? This, eight years pastoring. How many years we've we been born again? What? Okay, so, so from 91 to 2010, we sat where you sat, right? Okay, and when, the, but we always knew that there was a call in our lives. And just like he said, you know, you know you're called, but many times it's like, uh, what do I do with the calling? All of us struggle with that, every last one of us, I don't care. Billy Graham, Kenneth Copeland, you name the, you know, Martin Luther, I mean, you know. But, but what you learn along the way will help you arrive to the place that you've been called to, yes. if you allow it to. Yes. There is not a perfect church that exists on the planet. Amen. You know why? Because people in it. It's it, because it's people. Uh, you know, I went to this, we went to this last minister's conference weeks ago, and one of the speakers said, you know, which we've all heard, ministry would be great if it didn't involve people. Yeah. Yeah. But it involves people. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do, right? Most people do not, in general, most people do not seek out God until they get in trouble. Yeah. A few people, and there's some in this room, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, not many of us, but there are some people who serve the Lord from, from the age of some of the babies that we've got in here and never know a time of a way. But I guarantee you they know a time of being challenged by people in the church. Right? So with that being said, because I spent more time on that side, I've learned over the last eight years of doing this how easy it is for me to be offended. 
And I'm a person that, you know, we used to have a young lady that worked with us. She and her husband and family moved out of town a few years ago. And she said, I have, she, she used to tell Pastor that she said, I, I have an unoffended. And the first time I heard that, I thought, yeah, right. Let the right person at the right time in the right circumstance say the wrong thing. We're going to find out. And the Lord said, she's telling the truth because she has made a choice that no matter what comes, I am not getting moved off the place. Like he said, you don't just push the train, you get derailed. And she made that choice. And the Lord said, you've made the choice, but now you're starting to see how important the choice is. Speaking to me, that you made it early on in life. And I was sitting as Kelsey was, was leading worship, man, I, you know, just the spirit of remembrance came on me. And I can remember, I remembered it was a Sunday evening about this time, give or take a few hours, a few years ago in my life that I walked into an emergency room and I, with, with my two sons and my daughter didn't leave the emergency room with us. And I was mad, right? Because I had a different expectation of God. <laughs> but God is not here to meet your expectation. He's here to make you who he intends for you to be. You and I to be, right? And so Jesus said in Luke 17 and 1, as he said, it's impossible that offenses will come. The offense is a spirit. We know that. You know, and that spirit's job is to derail your Christian life. And if, listen, if he can't derail it, he will try to make it underproductive or unproductive. If he can't make it underproductive, he will try to make it painful. If he can't make it he will try his best to just make it n numbing. Mm -hmm. You ever been around a numb Christian? Yeah. They have zero response to the Spirit of God. In the, in the scripture he read over, over in uh, Ephesians, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to do a recall here. And I had somebody sharing a story with me this morning after today's message. I just kind of sat there because I was like, Lord, there's so much that I didn't say. He said, he said don't worry about it. That's what my job is, not yours. And so in talking about that, something that Mike said, see, what happens is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is able to be grieved, right? right. So I had somebody relaying a story to me today. I won't tell you it was not, not important. And as the individual was sharing with me, they said that they went to a church that they frequently attend because they wanted to, uh, that it's just what they did uh, on a six-month rotation or whatever. And they went to the church for quite a while and they said pastor I went there and uh, the, the pastor was talking about the Holy Spirit and he said I listened I thought okay this should be interesting and the pastor started talking about various things regarding the Holy Spirit and so the person that was relaying the story to me said he they asked them speaking in tongues they asked them uh, about uh, being uh, he didn't use the word they didn't use the word slain but falling out in the spirit and the pastor said to them, oh, that's, that's, that's not relevant. We don't, we don't have gifts anymore. This is what the pastor told them. We don't have gifts. We don't, that's not relevant. And I, I'm listening to that, and I'm thinking, okay, and I didn't say anything because I, I don't want to be church bashing. I don't do that kind of stupid stuff, you know. I pick on religion. That's what I do. Anyway, and so as, as the individual was saying it to me, they said that, well, we'll come back. And they came, went back the next Sunday or next day that they had worship, and they were there. And the pastor had prepared a presentation about the Holy Spirit, and he, they said that they had about 30-some scriptures that talked about the Holy Spirit, but not one had anything to do with the gifts of the Spirit, not one had anything to do with speaking in tongues, and not one had anything to do with, with uh, 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 falling out or being laid out, slain out in the Spirit. And he said, as he was, was, was dealing with it, he says to me, he says, well, pastor, he said, because I asked him, how did that make you feel? He said, well, I felt... Like I knew something. I didn't agree, but I knew something. And the individual that was there with him said that, well, it is not God's will for anybody to ever find his power or to speak in other tongues. That's what he said to him. And he looked at me and he said, it hurt. 
it hurt. And the Holy Spirit told me today, when, when I was uh, coming in here, he said, tell him this story because it was an example of not the individual, but it was the Holy Spirit himself who had been hurt. He had been wounded, he had been grieved. Because the same experience that you have, that you and I have, he wants for everybody to have in the body. Right. To one degree or another, just how hungry you are. And what offense does, it prevents that. And I wrote a, I wrote a note as Mike was preaching, I wrote a note that said, this is like Dave and Janice, you know, I, I'm gonna say something, is that okay? Dave and Janice are not, they, they're first husband and wife. Y'all know that, right? Y'all should know that about them, right? They tried this, for lack of a better term, with somebody else, right? And it didn't work. And guess what? It's okay, as long as you get it right. But here's the, here's the point. If, if, if Dave comes into the relationship with Janice with offense, guess what's going to happen? Without it being dealt with, it's going to grow. And at some point, if it's not dealt with, now it's by admitting it, right? Getting over it, walking in love. What happens? She gets to the point, and I'm hypothetically speaking, obviously, because they, they're successfully married a long time now. She gets tired of it and has to walk away. So, so this is what the world does. So, you know, he's like, you know, 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 she's better off going anyway. That's what the world says. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. So what does he do then? He goes and he finds somebody else to be in relationship with, but the spirit is still there. And it's only waiting for the time to manifest. And it goes from relationship to relationship, to relationship. Now guess where else it goes? Now of course that's not y'all, we know that. It goes from church, to church, to church. And any church that, that, that fosters a spirit of offense and is not willing to openly deal with it with message, messages like this, is a church that will ultimately succumb to that spirit. And that's where church splits come from and many other things. So, Offense, you know, I told you a few weeks ago I was in Chicago, man, and you know, those defense signs, y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, the holding little white picket thing. Yes. And the Lord showed me, so he's like, do you see that, that there's, the team is out here and the person is here, and the person holding the sign is behind the fence, mm -hmm. wanting the team to do something, but they can't do it because they're non-participants. Yeah. Yeah. So you gotta put the fence down. I'm not advocating jumping out of the stands running on the go to jail, but, <laughs> But you got to put the fence down, the offense down, in order to enjoy the things of God. And Jesus clearly stated that as, as the days get closer, he read out of John Bevere's book, which many of us have studied, right? We got that. Um, it's going to be easier to be offended. Easier. You never know where it's coming from. And as a pastor, as, as serving as a shepherd, you know, uh, my wife and I, we constantly are reminded of the simplicity of offense, but the magnitude of the result or the outcome. Offense is simple. Offense is as simple as me not wearing the right clothing for somebody to say, I, I hear all the time. A lady told me last week, she said, boy, this is a great church. I'm not gonna say who it was, doesn't matter. This is a great church. She said, the greatest thing about it is you yell. <laughs> She said, you're yelling, I can hear. My church, they just stand there and talk like this. And then they, you know. But yelling offends some people. I don't think I yell. All y'all folks back from old school that grew up back in the day where preachers got on the wall. Yeah, I don't remember. I got short-term memory or something. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Where they rear back and, yeah. I, that's not me. But that is some people. Come here, Josh. Come here, man. Glory to God. Lord's, Lord's got something on your heart. And even if it's just an addiction, can you, can you pray for these people? Would you do that? You're not embarrassed to do that, are you? <laughs> I know. You said it's half over because you're already up here. Part. Would you would you stand to your feet? He's gonna dismiss us. He's gonna bless us. However you want to do it, you don't have to do it like me. You don't have to do it like your dad.
Please don't do it like your dad. Okay. <laughs> just pray for him and just tell him, just dismiss him. Lord, Father God, tonight, as they go home, that they'll have a good day at work tomorrow. And don't let people at their work offend them. Even if they want to get offended, don't let it happen. That when they go to sleep tonight, that they'll have good dreams about you and no demonic dreams that will overtake their body or get scared or whatever the case is. In the name of Jesus, as we go out today and all the offenses that come tomorrow, that we can block them out. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Amen.